the Escape Goat podcast. A podcast series featuring the discussion of many different topics, flaws and all, based on personal whims and fascinations. Hosted by me, David Blake Fagiani, and several different guests. Welcome to the Escape Goat podcast, um, a podcast about pretty much anything that I want to talk about. I'm uh, David Blake Fagiani, and uh, joining me today is uh, Matt Fagiani. Hey. Hey, hey, how's it going? Not too bad, not too bad. We are the uninfected. Yes, we are. We are, as far as we know, currently uninfected. <laughs> yeah. Um, Matt is my brother, and um, he's um, agreed to talk to me today about a topic that is, seems especially relevant. Uh, to where we are at the moment and um, we're recording this in uh, March 2020 uh, during I suppose what we're assuming is the early stages of the coronavirus uh, outbreak yeah but hopefully uh, well it probably is the early stages I think I'll be a bit wishful thinking that this is anywhere near the peak yes for, for, for someone for people listening to this in the future in the unlikely event that you don't know what the coronavirus outbreak was uh, it appears to be well officially as of last week a global pandemic uh, involving a flu variant uh, which uh, as as well as as of today's recording is leading to many many uh, cancelled and commercial events uh, flights uh, international um uh, martial law essentially of states of emergency uh, it to say it's disruptive is 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 putting it mildly and obviously it looks like it's going to temper most of the rest of 2020 um which yeah. would be great well, we're kind of um we're victims of this already like having both of our holidays cancelled trips to um the islands of spain cancelled um we're the real victims we're the real (laughs) yeah yeah but uh we're very embittered about it at the moment but it's given us a a little bit of um uh a uh what was the word (laughs) 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 we're just delirious from the early stages of the virus (laughs) yeah yeah basically this is the (laughs) this is the last holdout podcast yeah we decided we decided to celebrate during a pandemic by getting together in a very small room uh, and breathing on each other (laughs) yeah (laughs) looking each other directly in the face yeah yeah. and uh just chatting crap yeah we um we we decided we 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 weren't um sure what we're going to address today we had a few candidates uh, for topics of discussion and we decided to talk um today partly because of um, the relevance um, about uh, well about two examples of the zombie genre uh, particularly as they relate to um, the spread of zombie epidemics and um, what that sort of says about the form and our own fascinations and uh, in that we're going to be quite wide-ranging but we're also specifically going to talk about uh, two things primarily one of which is the um, 2005 six book uh, World War Z by Max Brooks and its various um, adaptations uh, and uh, then uh, the you know canonical zombie classic um, Day of the Dead, which is also my my personal favorite out of the uh, Romero trilogy, and uh, definitely my favorite zombie film of all time. Nineteen eighty five. Eighty five. Yeah. Nineteen eighty five zombie what film. A great year for horror. I mean, the nineteen eighty five brought Day of the Dead, The Hitcher, Fright Night. Fright Night. Yeah. Um, God, there's so many movies in eighty five that are just you know incredible. It's a great year for horror. Return of the Living Dead being another one i heard an interesting story recently that um people uh, day of the dead did very bad commercially mainly because people went to see return of the living dead which was more of a studio you know dan o'bannon like you know Mm. movie quite high profile and people mistook it for day of the dead uh so they went to see that instead and uh, george romero ended up making very little money from it oh that's a a real shame which sucks yeah after dawn and night being such huge successes we'll get on to day of the dead um later but i think it's safe to say it's a it's a very firm favorite of yours and I, I'm, I have a lot of regard for it it's the most visceral and sort of dark and dank of the whole series and i think that's partially why i'm such a big fan of it i'm also a fan of uh third trilogy movies you know like so for well, third third in most trilogies actually sonic 3 is <laughs> my favorite <laughs> sonic game sonic uh, 3. jedi and um what else uh day of the dead and like yeah mostly i for some reason i'm just drawn to if you don't say Alien Three, I'm gonna say it. Oh, Alien Three! Oh my God! Yeah, how could I forget? <laughs> that, that was surprising. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was too close to my mind. <laughs> yeah. um, I before we get into the depths of either of those of those um, of those works, um, what, could you just tell us a little bit about your own um, kind of fascination with and familiarity with with you know the zombie horror genre, how you came to it? Well, I believe me, I've put a lot of thought into this and 
how my love of zombies really came about and i think that, that having thought about it for the last two decades um it's it's resident evil mm. you know that's where it goes back to for me because you know basically zombie the zombie genre was an incredibly geeky niche genre not mainstream whatsoever until uh, 1998 um was uh, released was resident evil mm. when you would you would have been about what, 11 something like yeah, that yeah yeah actually have i got that right resident evil 2 might have been 98 sorry i think that maybe resident evil was even 96 I think, 97 I think, I think that's about yeah that's yeah. about right yeah. and um yeah so that that was that was the time that like zombies you know i mean you, you always know zombies you know it's, it's always a thing that's like, one of these things that you, you know you always know about the candy man you always know about zombies you know the lore of vampires you know who frankenstein is or you know who his monster was and but th- these are the that that's when it really became something that i was involved with and scared me to death because those games were terrifying back in the day i remember locking myself in uh, in this very room that we we're in actually um and playing those games and it just being terrifying and the tension and the suspense of when those zombie arms were going to come through the boarded windows and get you so then after that um it, my introduction to zombie movies uh, had to be in the early days of of um digital tv uh for uh, film four and channel four used to show um uh, they had a channel called film four extreme that was like a oh, you know, film part for of extreme yeah you remember that and um they they Mark Commode used to introduce B movies, um, you know, video nasties like movies that were considered, you know, and it was some movies that were, you know, had been banned up to that point, you know, like, until the sort of late nineties, you know, things like The Exorcist that wasn't released on video uh, again until nineteen ninety eight, you know, things like that. Zombie Flesh Eaters, which was banned as a video nasty, mm. and um, so I think that I f- saw day of the dead first out of the romero trilogy oh interesting i'm pretty sure that's accurate it's very difficult to remember but i'm pretty sure they came first then dawn then night so that could be one of the reasons why it's so kind of cemented you know in my mind and when i first saw it we recorded it off film for extreme and i just enjoyed it so much it's it scared me it, it was really visceral the, the best gore effects i'd ever seen that you know just looked real to me the sort of snapping back of the latex flesh mm. as the zombies bit through it it was it made such an impact on me that i took it around to friends houses and showed it to everybody and we you know, it became an event you know and we would all you know get together and it was such a rowdy atmosphere because i think people you know my male friends mainly that i showed it to were disturbed by it but mm. the way to react to that was to be hyper masculine and go hey and celebrate rather than going oh yeah. jesus power through the, power the, the through disturbance it. yeah yeah exactly yeah. and so yeah it became an event and that that's probably my introduction how, how about you that's interesting yeah um i, I well i you know i wasn't a playstation guy really so i kind of saw other people playing resident evil and I, you know I, I, I sort of i suppose i sort of ingested some of the genre tropes probably quite early on from that yeah i think the zombie genre is one of those things like especially the you know the arguable oversaturation we've had a bit in the last two decades it's very hard to go back to a time before you remember those but i probably put them up in the late 90s as well and i think i saw um i think i saw night of the living dead pretty early on in the sense of probably when i was about 12 mm. 13 something like that you know i saw i saw it out it was probably a late night um tv thing as well yeah um because i knew it was you know i was a nerdy film teenager so I, I, I had loads of books about canonical great horror movies and you know i knew that was one to see um I remember seeing. Sorry to interrupt you. I remember also you having a an Empire or a film magazine that had a picture of like the Evil Dead in it, and it had a picture of the, the you know the the bloke's head like cut in half with the axe, and it said yeah. like the original bloody minded half wit or something. Oh, yeah, that's that right. That's and right. Yeah. So that that for me is quite clear. I don't know if you remember that as well. We as had well, yeah. Well, yeah. I had a lot of that. I think it was like an Empire Fifty Greatest Horror Movies yeah, or something that like it, that. Yeah. And that I, I can imagine Night of the Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead both featured in that. Yeah. Um, I think. Uh, I've I've always been uh, interested in, in horror in general as far yeah. as I can remember and I think the like, zombie movies very early on proved to be like a sort of particularly interesting manifestation of that anxiety you know like yeah, I think it's been possibly a, t- a topic that's been over analyzed on the internet is, is why zombie movies are, are, are prevalent and why what, yeah. what they have to say about humanity you know yeah. the, the themes contained therein um, and I you know got on board that as much as everyone else did I think I, I think because I wasn't coming at it from being a Resident Evil fan, it must have been interesting for you watching, um, you know, the Romero zombie movies um, to see, you know, you know, people often complain that 
video game fans have never had like you know a, a satisfactory video game adaptation it must have been odd for you seeing something that kind of before the fact was yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly well it, the, the one of the most i think the thing that springs to mind is because like one of the jump scares on the resident evil games where you'd be running down a corridor and the arms would come through the window of the police station mm. and um you know grab you through the through the the, the sort of boarded up windows that happens in Night of the Living Dead, right? You know? yeah. And so that felt old and tired. I thought, well, th- you know, don't go past that window because something yes, will grab so. you. You know, so, so it's, it's like a that. tribute in, in in Resident Evil. It's a tribute to Night of the Living Dead, but you're then seeing Night of the Living Dead, yeah, and almost as a tribute to Resident Evil, or at least you can enjoy it that way. And yeah. and yeah, exactly. And, and and you know, thinking about it now, the Dawn of the Dead, uh, which is you know, uh, which has these undertones, well, <laughs> not very subtle undertones about consumerism, you know, which you know has been done to death. You know, people have talked about this you know endlessly um that isn't well that isn't in resident evil that that's that's not one one of the themes of the games so that felt more original in a lot of ways you know that having that under like social satire of dawn and then um day of the dead which you know is is again it, it didn't have as much in common with the uh with, with the resident evil series you know in terms of setting or anything so that felt wholly original as well i think that resident evil actually has a lot more you know in common with night of the living dead than either of its sequels really mm. come to think of it yeah that's that's interesting in terms of the house in the middle of nowhere with the boarded up windows and you know it sort of takes um i suppose if you're just talking about the influences on resident evil of like the De romero trilogy it sort of takes elements from all of them doesn't it including you're right that sort of well i i always saw the the haunted house in the original resident evil as almost like a sort of scooby-doo version of night of the living dead you know it's got yeah. that sort of amped up cartoonish ott let's isn't split it? up and go and look around and see you know what happens yeah and, and it's got i think i'm correct in saying what is it giant spiders carnivorous yeah. plants you know it's, it's kind of like every b movie isn't it almost in a um almost in a um uh cabin in the woods yeah absolutely yeah no it really does actually oh when you say that's like the this kind of virus that infects everything every living thing so you can have giant mutated spiders or lizards crocodiles you know yeah. in the sewers and yeah so it's it's an excuse to play with b-movie tropes isn't it and a lot yeah. of it's present you know we've discussed this many times before off might but like you know it's it resident evil is is an unusually cinematic you know in the sort of stricter sense of the unusually cinematic game in the sense yeah. that you've got quite a lot of fixed camera angles and, and... pre-rendered backgrounds that, that looked you know s- photographic because they were they were just still photos basically of backgrounds you know that were that at the time tricked you into thinking it was incredible graphics but now you realize it was still images that you were sort of playing in front of yeah but uh, it was very original i mean there was no other game that looked like it and, uh, yeah it was... i mean it has it because it has jump scares but unlike yeah. in some video games like first person shooters and and, and other other genres you in, in Resident Evil, they're like definitely cinematic jump scares, aren't yeah. they? Like they often rely on a fixed camera being in a certain place and the character yeah. being a certain distance from that fixed camera, oh, being unable to see around the corner you're about to go around. And another huge uh, part of Resident Evil is the music and just how incredibly cinematic the music is and memorable. Um, we were just talking about this uh, as well. That uh, I had uh, a very interesting point made about the Romero trilogy is that the uh, the original movies are part so successful partially because they have such memorable scores and uh, anything that romero did after that has a very throwaway uninteresting score therefore is less memorable and i think uh, going by that i think that's another reason that people when i talk about resident evil 2 you know resident evil 1 they they, they say i remember the music that's mm. one of the biggest things that people talk about and so it really put you right in the uh really played with your emotions and yeah, it was fantastic i think i think we can probably move on in a second i was i was i was thinking we'd take world war z first and then uh, move on to uh, day of the dead but i think we've got into so many um so much romero discussion already we can pretty much move straight on to day of the dead and do it the other way around but just before i get into that i wanted to mention that you of course um have experience of uh, making your own zombie uh short movie uh, yeah do you want to tell us a little bit about that and how that came about yeah well that was that was really interesting for me like on in retrospect looking back because it was very much like i i came out of of college and university with a, a, mu- a music and sound engineering degree but that also basically in, encompassed a lot of video, um, sound editing for films and dubbing and foley and you know making movie soundtracks essentially mm. as well as making my own music for movies and i remember walking to the shops and walking back and in that time i had the uh, the entire premise of a short film just came to me like mm-hmm. that you know just completely and it was basically that thing of like when anyone asks you the Romero question what would you do where would you go if this happened to you if a zombie outbreak happened and I thought I'd go to Safeway you know now Morrison's yeah I'd go to Morrison's like on the hill and that's where I'd go you know that's the safest place it's a huge building full of cans of food 
it's got Stuck an up upstairs. toilet rolls past toilet through. rolls <laughs> yeah <laughs> all the <Yeah>. essentials <laughs> there's probably no toilet roll in there right now but <laughs> yeah. yeah um but yeah and so it basically came from that and then i just thought two people stuck together and you happen to be stuck with someone you don't like and you don't get on with and you basically have no hope and so all well, you that's, want that's to do is stuck up on creature comforts like alcohol and cigarettes that's instantly a sitcom isn't it it's a, it's a survival sitcom yeah it's basically a sitcom that isn't funny <laughs> it's a sit <laughs> yeah. what I took is the sitcom form and decided to make it not funny <laughs> it's a zombie sitting yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah and, and what I you know again in retrospect is like everything I do now creatively you know inverted commas is I second guess myself and I think is it worth doing probably not is it mm. too much effort that was just I had the idea in my head and I knew exactly how I was going to do it and you know everything and just took a year and just did it like you know got everyone involved that I could called on all my friends just to come around and play zombies and and it was just yeah just make pretend and what, <laughs> was, what was that film called uh, Red Harvest it Red was Harvest called, yeah it was a uh, sort of 10 15 I think it was 15 minutes short uh, still on YouTube actually uh, if you can see it but it we'll was, link to that in the show notes yeah yeah god I've not watched it for a long time but, yeah I'll be, uh, I'll be interested to see that again myself yeah it was a lot of fun and it's it's important to note, isn't it, that you were making that? I think it was uh, towards the was it in the late noughties? Um Yeah, it was. Um, it was finished in two thousand and ten, very early. But I think we started probably like wrote it in like two thousand and eight, you know, mm. and then just got going and you know took about a year to get it all done. But it was an absolute crash course in just how to make a film and how to get stuff together and continuity and makeup and just everything done completely instinctively like with no train real training you know I, the only training i had was in the edit you know in like editing sound and and stuff like that uh, but it was a really great learning process and um yeah and just a great way to great way to start like i always say to people just just do something like you know you don't need mm. a plan or you just go for it you know like, just you, if you're excited about it just do it yeah yeah and collaborate with others you know yeah, yeah. and everyone i think that's another thing that i realized that people can sense your you know your fear so if i came to someone today and said i think i want to make a film but i'm not 100 percent. would you be up for getting involved like people can tell that you're afraid <laughs> like but then i was just like right we're making a zombie film it's all written down i've got it it's yeah, great i've right, got a clipboard this 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 and this yeah you know you go and do that and people i think it's very contagious mm. that enthusiasm and that's something that you know when you're like 20 21 you might have more of mm. uh, naivete as well just you know just doing it you know for the because you want to you know there's like nothing else yeah, there's no, yeah, yeah. No, I think I think that is a, that is an important impulse to have in that sort of thing. And I think actually, it's it's interesting you mentioned that sort of DIY drive because that, um, particularly following on from Shaun of the Dead in the noughties, um making a zombie movie or contributing to zombie movies, and it became quite a big thing. Like from the highest budget down to sort of you know DIY productions. And mm. it's interesting that we're about to talk about Romero in more depth. And, and uh, George A. Romero is kind of a pioneering figure in terms of that, isn't he? Not, in t- not only in terms of crafting and almost founding the genre but, yeah. but in terms of his production methods uh, particularly on night but going through the entire original trilogy and actually more recently as well yeah the the the, the how uh night of the living dead came about was that basically like romero had um nine friends who they worked and they made television commercials like for calgon and things like that you know in pittsburgh and uh they basically formed a company with 10 people him included and they called themselves image 10 and they all put um was it 10 was it a thousand dollars yeah i think they all put to a thousand dollars and then they had ten thousand dollars and then they just said we're gonna make a scary movie and it was called night of the ghouls to begin with mm. uh zombies were never mentioned and still aren't mentioned at all in the i was gonna think ghouls ghouls occurs a few times in night of the living dead doesn't it they actually called them ghouls yeah because i think that was the original working title was night of the ghouls and it was just a business venture you know it was just like we're gonna make a movie that's gonna show in the drive-ins and gonna make us loads of money and it it did like essentially apart from they forgot to copyright it that's the main thing that's why you know, <laughs> used to go in hmv you know there'd be like nine different companies releasing night of the living dead they just forgot to put the c at the end of the uh, i had an amazing copy of uh night of the living dead not back in the day when i was first watching it but um i think i bought it later at uni in a charity shop and it was uh it was a vhs version of night of the living dead and it was colorized oh, yeah. and it was colorized badly <laughs> Uh, to kind of pastel colors just blotted everywhere yeah kind of kind of crazy blotchy technicolor is the best way i can describe yeah. it but there was also weird things like the, you know there's, there's like fire and petrol bombs and stuff in the movie and when they went off it looked like a like a vat of custard had exploded it was just like a yellow oh, bright yellow flame and it was really it was quite an odd experience to watch it actually. turns it into kind of an animation 
it kind of it was a bit like um something like a scanner darkly it was it was yeah. like something that had been like shaded over well i guess that's how they do it but maybe a uh, film wasn't animation anyway because it's essentially 24 frames of like a still image that are moving but but yeah that's uh, that's great i think i think i remember seeing a few bits of that i think you remember or seeing it on in the background when you were watching it yeah it's worth um, tracking down i should i should digitize it really. might be on youtube now maybe like because you know i think that living dead is is public domain essentially so you can get them mm. I'm sure there's all, all sorts of different bootlegs of it yeah um but yeah so that, that's how the that movie came about and uh, what i find the most fascinating is because when everyone talks about night of the living dead they talk about it being progressive and being noteworthy because it has a black lead and uh, mm. Dwayne jones plays uh, the lead in this movie he happens to be african-american romero says i don't think you take him at his word says that the only reason they cast Dwayne was because he was the best actor out of their friends um and you know it had nothing to do with him being Af- african-american but because he gets you know spoilers because he gets executed at the end uh somewhat accidentally by these this white rabble of rednecks and then thrown on the pyre at the end you know that makes it uh you know a, a kind of basically a civil rights movie it's like it's all you know that that's that becomes a subtext was that accidental or not he says it was but there, there it is it's that sort of old debate isn't it about how uh you know these these films and other works of art can be phenomenally resonant seemingly through no deliberate action of the author or creator you know they, they just end yeah. up in being these things that have this massive impact and sort of contemporary relevance uh, yeah no one seems to know how it got there well the thing is i suppose at the end of the day every movie is political whether you want mean it to be or not your mm. politics are going to filter through you into your production into your art whatever you want to call it uh with whether you mean it to or not you know it's in your consciousness you know it's going to come out well the, i suppose the mere act of if we're really going to get into the weeds here but the, the, the mere act of telling a story right is, is you know you're choosing what narrative is important you're choosing what em- elements to emphasize yeah that's essentially a political choice or a series of political choices yeah absolutely yeah yeah no exactly that that informs the story that you write and if you're an auteur like he was wrote the script directed it you know because it's like when you watch like certain movies you think oh why is this like the third teenager we've seen molested in like the last <laughs> you know hour of this movie you know whether it be sore or something you know like that you think yes this is political whether you mean it to be or not yeah and horror movies are a particularly interesting genre to analyze for that you know because they've got such a mix of you know usually quite um obvious commercial imperatives yeah. um but also their their sort of subject matter is anxiety yeah you know at high or you know grand guignol levels or right down to the mon- the seemingly mundane and sort yeah. of thematic so it's kind of that they're, they're, they're a fascinating sort of um, Rorschach test for you know what what goes into making um, political art yeah know? absolutely you know and it, it draws for me there's a lot of similarities between Night of the Living Dead and Alien in that respect that Sigourney Weaver's character wasn't ri- written as female well, you know it was just Ripley mm-hmm. you know so that you know when you it works so brilliantly and it becomes progressive because of that you know but you know the movie didn't call for that you know the, the script didn't call for that it was just a casting choice i think i think brief sidebar on alien because i think it's it's sort of relevant and you're right you know they have some things in common you know i mean they're essentially like survivor movies that winnow things down to you know one or or fewer survivors yeah. um i think uh the the acts as you say like are of survival and the choice of who survives or who uh becomes a protagonist in the movie mm. is 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 quite important isn't it because we've talked many times about what different versions of alien would be like where you just arbitrarily choose that one of the other characters is 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 the last survivor yeah you could basically have like so many alternate versions of the same movie it's uh, that's that's really interesting yeah yeah like i mean you know for instance if yafet koto is mm. is the guy who makes it to the shuttle pod i mean that that would be remembered as you know you were describing that Living Dead as a sort of civil rights resident movie i mean oh, yeah. that, that would be right up there with it you know oh absolutely yeah yeah jesus i never really never thought of that and you know because you, you yeah i mean every, every uh whatever happens you know whatever combination of deaths or like in different order it still has a you know an amazing resonance in in one way or the other mm, you know because mm. you've also got lambert in there you know like you know you could have her survival i mean you know. even harry dean stanton you know like with the yeah. character he's playing in that you know if he if he was the final survivor i think it would be seen as a sort of you know class uh warfare kind of you know the, mm. the, the guy from below decks is that is the guy who knows his stuff the most you yeah, know? Exa- yeah exactly yeah exactly yeah I think there's many fascinating parallel versions of Alien you can imagine. I, getting back to the Romero trilogy, um, I, I think you've described Day of the Dead uh, as your, not necessarily the best, but your favourite of the original Romero trilogy. Is that is that the case? I think it's 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 Alien Three and Alien. So you know when I watch Dawn, I think Dawn of the Dead. I think this is a bigger project. There's so much more going on. 
blah 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 you know there's more bells and whistles in a way you know there's you know huge set pieces with the bikers at the end and everything why don't i love this as much as i love day of the dead you know it's kind of i still love it i think mm. it's still one of my favorite movies ever made but uh day of the dead elements of day of the dead just resonate with you more maybe i i, I think it's like deep down with these things i think dawn of the dead is a party movie you know it's a it's a very very kind of bombastic you know colorful bright loud exciting experience with lots of comedy in it and i think at the i think deep in my heart i know that a zombie apocalypse isn't funny <laughs> you know i think that's probably <laughs> yeah. what it is i think we're about to find out exactly how funny an apocalypse is yeah ex- well yeah exactly and i'm prepared because I, I like day better you know so it's <laughs> like i think that that's probably what it is it cuts straight to the quick and it's just like mm. this isn't actually going to be fun mm. this is going to be hell on earth you know like he says you know this is you know going to give us a taste of what hell was like you know, it's, it's, it's not without it's not without comedy day of the dead but it's it's quite a bleak film isn't it I know, even for even for horror the co- the, there's a difference between i'd say dawn of the dead was partially a comedy because there's comic music on the soundtrack yes and things to make the custard pie fights funny whereas in day of the dead the characters say funny things but it's not a comedy mm. do you know what i mean i think there's a huge difference there i think that dawn of the dead is actually played for laughs whereas Day of the Dead is super serious. However, some of the characters occasionally say funny things. For for some of our listeners who might not have seen Day of the Dead, um, would you can you, can you like very briefly explain what what happens in Day of the Dead, what the focus is in Day of the Dead? Yeah, so it basically the uh, Day of the Dead is about a group of twelve survivors of uh, a zombie apocalypse who are basically a, a mixture of a military and scientific team. The military there essentially to protect and to facilitate the job of the scientific team who are trying to. Uh, find a answer to why this is happening and possibly find a cure which they are not doing <laughs> very successfully and uh and that they have a uh, an underground base that's in the florida keys that's a very secure sort of ex-military bunker type of thing storage bunker and it within that they have science labs a huge mess hall and they have a corral which is like a cattle um cage full of um specimens they call them zombies that they have basically you know snatched from above and brought down into this layer to keep for scientific experiments so zombies are still on their doorstep but because of for the, because of their own doing of course because it's always human beings who uh, you know fuck everything up for themselves so that's that's the basic uh, setting of it and um, it's basically about the tensions between the scientists and the military and how the military become sick of of basically cooling their heels and facilitating the team while they seem to be um not producing any results of why this is happening and although it's the third uh romero zombie film uh arguably uh and uh or certainly the third of that what's seen as that trilogy it's a very loose third in the trilogy isn't it i mean really you could look at the romero trilogy as more of a, a set of anthology films being made during the same in, you know being made feasibly in the same universe yeah I, I always thought of them as being in the same universe approximately you know i'd say maybe three years apart or thereabouts you know mm. maybe like you know the first one is you know the night of the reckoning and then you maybe dawn is well no, i think dawn's brought do you think about a month maybe after because it's this it's still new to pittsburgh this thing is happening then day i always thought it was being probably about a year after that or maybe you're aware things of you know the, the radios have started to fall silent you know and they, they've become increasingly alone i suppose day of the, the dead and particularly the sights you get of um of florida at the beginning of the movie they they have a sort of um i am legend feel to them don't they they, they have they, they have a, they, they, it's very much post-apocalyptic you know in, in night yeah. of the living dead and Dawn of the dead you're in the, in a sense in the middle of an apocalypse they're, they're, they're very much the apocalypse has happened what do we do now absolutely yeah and, and, that, and that's what's re- what i love so much about that intro is it does look like the omega man actually you know the um Hel- the charlton heston movie which is funnily enough what george romero said he directly ripped off to make night of the living dead he said it's a ripoff of i am legend he said that mm-hmm. you know, many many mm-hmm. times publicly um but that opening, uh, I just watched Day last night actually for this uh, to, for this podcast to uh, sort of brush up, even though I've seen it eighty times. Um, but <laughs> no exaggeration. And the what I love so much about the intro for people who haven't seen it, uh, it starts with a helicopter with our you know some of our sort of main uh, initial uh, characters for the movie, basically scouting up and down the Florida Keys looking for survivors. They set down on this uh, deserted high street and they get on the bullhorn and they call for any survivors to come 
come there to to um to, to them and they'll help them and you basically see the zombies who are kind of in this almost asleep basically because they've got nothing to eat and they wake up one by one and you know within a matter of minutes there's thousands of zombies walking down the high street to them the two uh sarah and her um uh, boyfriend uh, character in the movie is one of the military guys run back to the helicopter and, and leave and it's so such a great intro because you've got this amazing set piece this action scene that's about to happen and then you pull away and mm. you're like you're left with this horrible screaming on the soundtrack of the zombies all massing and it's like this echoing screaming zombie and it's just so disturbing and then they get back on the helicopter and you just realize this is going to be a different type of film this is going to be so bleak you know because there's nothing they can do you know i think that's true and i think that's why romero films oddly sit outside kind of a lot of the generic limitations that you tend to think movies like that might have because i think in a film you know when i first saw that i don't remember specifically but Mm. i think if you when you hear the premise quite early on that they are in a base that's designed to try and find a cure for the zombie epidemic um which of course is never found in those movies you know it's never even really attributed properly um but um which is great um but um i think even in that the mood established in those only scenes you kind of sense that's not going to be what this is no this no. is despite their efforts this is not going to come to anything no exactly yeah and i think that's the hopelessness you really feel from the first minute you know like watching that and there's that great line uh in the speech you know that uh and sarah's uh talking to um uh, the helicopter pilot and he's basically very kind of whimsical and quite philosophical about the whole situation and he just says you're never going to figure it out just why they never figured out why the stars are where they are and that that line just creeps me out so much because it's just it confirms that you know you just it, there's no point doing any of this you know this is just something a natural thing that is going to occur and you're just going to have to it's the next stage of evolution somehow you know this is then and i think that's what I love about it, and like you said, there's never ever a cause attributed. Mm. There's a mention in Night of the Living Dead about a satellite crashing and burning. Yeah, back some to sort of something from, from Mars. Venus or Mars. Or Mars yeah. Yeah. It's, I think it might be Venus, you might be right. But it's a background detail, isn't it? It's, it's a it's a TV announcement that you can choose to read it you know, as, as the cause. Yeah, and um, even on TV they say they, they don't know whether that's got anything to do with it or if it's just a coincidence. Um, and because unlike uh, we, you know, I mean, the, the thing is, before Night of the Living Dead, I mean, the, George Romero is known as the the father of the you know the genre, uh, the god the grandfather of the genre, quite rightly, because he basically took the zombie thing, which was a thing that existed for you know a hundred years before, mm. but it, from a sort of um, a voodoo Haitian thing that was more about enslaving people's minds and turning them into kind of like walking. Uh, slaves basically yes, essentially yeah. kind of like brain dead creature like uh, people and then uh move that to more of like a sort of uh you know put it in the sort of american like western world and did it as something that was just less explicable it wasn't to do with witch doctors or to do with voodoo it was just inexplicable which yeah. for me again the ambiguity makes it so much scarier you know yeah i suppose there's yeah it's two things isn't it because again go back to political art it, i suppose there is a sense in which romero's taking um you know black caribbean traditions about slavery anxieties and and giving them uh you know giving them a caucasian uh expression should we yes, say you yeah. know although you know obviously that it's a bit more complicated than that um i was thinking about the um the aesthetic as well of uh of, of day of the dead um, i remember i remember we were talking once about um the sort of nebulous idea of what's the difference between like you know a an a movie you know a legitimate um big budget or sort of legitimate movie and, and a b movie you know because yeah. we've got ob- obviously these are catch-all terms but you know you can draw some arbitrary limits and we had fun conversations about that but i remember one in particular where we were talking about the romero trilogy mm. and we sort of collectively decided that although there's millimeters in it dawn of the dead is the not not in terms of quality but is, is kind of the least legitimate lowest a movie yes the sort of least legitimate mainstream prestige movie yes. possible and day of the dead is the like just under the ice Day of the Dead is the highest B movie it's possible to make. It, it's amazing. That's 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 exactly right. I think that's so accurate. You know, like in because it's 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 like Romero after Night of the Living Dead was kind of at the height of his fame and given a lot more you know license to do whatever he wanted to do and became this cool director. He made Dawn and that was incredibly successful. And then, but I think with I, I, it's it, it's very interesting. Like you know when you show someone. <laughs> I think Romero movies climb the ladder 
to the uh, you know top of the B, bottom of the A status, the more you watch them and the more movies you watch. Mm. Because when I first saw Dawn and Day, I thought these are C list movies, you know, mm. let forget alone B movies, you know. And then now they're at the top, and like you know, I think when I watch them, they look like the cleanest, most polished movies ever. Because I watch Lucio Fulci, like Italian movies, Spanish zombie movies from yes, like the yeah. late 70s. <laughs> you know things that are properly b movies you know really <laughs> that have no budget mm. you know let alone a small budget you know like and and so it's it's interesting they kind of become <laughs> higher class as time goes mm. on yeah you've got if anything a higher appreciation for them when you see everything that tried to follow in their footsteps yeah how i ever thought these were b movies i really don't you know real b movies i don't know you know because they just seem so brilliant you know mm. compared to some of the awful stuff that i've watched and that's genuinely bad yeah <laughs> you know it's kind of interesting how your perception changes as time goes on mm, mm. i think um i think day of the dead is uh aesthetically fascinating for all kinds of reasons we were talking a bit off mic before the podcast about the music in it mm. uh, which you mentioned before in the, you know the way they use that in the opening to build foreboding um i've described it to you as i think i think you know maybe up there with the terminator in terms of being a a score which is very distinctively 1980s yeah um but also you know cre- like ec- eccentrically creative uh and, yeah. and, and wonderful at building that mood it's it's incredibly uh memorable i mean like all the scores for all the romero movies are incredibly memorable especially the first three uh well the first three um in particular um what do you i mean with the with day of the dead you think that because it's kind of got like a Caribbean calypso thing mixed with, you know, where you've got like the steel pans and all that kind of thing mixed with um, a kind of techno beats and things. The The movie is set in Florida, technically, although you wouldn't know it from most of it because it's set underground. Mm. And it was actually filmed in Pittsburgh, uh, the underground parts. The beginning of the intro was filmed in Florida and all the outdoor scenes. But uh, So it's kind of reminding you that there's a beautiful... I suppose that, that's how it works, isn't it? Because it's reminding you, like the character John says there's a whole world out there that we're just wasting you know being mm. down here you know why don't we just go to an island get juiced up and enjoy some sunshine you know that's what he says so i suppose it's constantly reminding you of why the hell are these people down here when they could be sunning themselves out in the florida keys you know i, I think i think it comes across as very much like a sort of um it, by showing you that that glimpse of florida you know horrific as it looks and mm. about uh, isolate and desolate that, as it looks by showing you that bright sun-drenched atmosphere I, and then saying most of the rest of the film you know essentially underground it, it, it i don't think i've seen many movies that feel more claustrophobic and it's because you've seen the sun yeah gives you a little taste at the beginning and says yeah that's what you could have but we're going to lock you and they make a a clear point of you know when the, the the hangar doors shut above them you know to lock the sun out they show that very clearly and it clangs shut you know and it's like yeah you're definitely going to be in here and when they were filming it you know the, in the mine it was it was filmed in a, in a, a sort of an old mine in pittsburgh and uh, the whole cast you know tom savini and greg nicotera all these you know up and coming makeup artists and everyone were saying it was basically like you were so unbelievably happy to be there because you were working on a george romero movie but everyone got ill you know, because everyone was breathing in this limestone dust, you know, and like, you know, being down there for months at a time, you know, and not getting a break. And uh, they said when they finally went to Florida, I think it was at the end of the shoot to film those scenes, that it was just like a breath of fresh air, you know, to get out and do these scenes. Uh, so, yeah, it was, um, it, you, you, but that really comes across in the way it's filmed and just how gritty and horrible it must have been. I think there's a sense in which uh, the Romero movies, and I, I suppose especially Day of the Dead following on the heel of the first two, comes across as a little bit like a sort of, um, uh, almost like an existential version of like a biblical curse story you know like like uh, there's a there's a great sense of cosmic horror throughout you know mm. as we've said before that you know the cause of the, pl- the zombie plague being unattributed but the sense of that that many characters express throughout the trilogy that this is something that's been visited on mankind mm. and that may be somewhat deserved or earned yeah there's that sort of actually just to wet the, the sort of lack of sunlight in this movie there's that sense in a sense of being shut out of eden isn't there there's like the characters are aware that they've lost humanity's birthright they're confined to the margins now they've been driven underground they're yeah. not you know it's it's not just that sense you get in many horror movies that humans aren't apex predators anymore it's that they in some sense deserve this new thing or at least it's an unavoidable fate and and they but they're like animals caught in a trap they're aware yeah. of it they're cursed to be aware how much they've lost yeah well exactly and you know john is the character who knows the most you know like out of them and is the most sensible in that respect because he just basically says you know probably you know he's through that speech is basically just saying you know think yourself lucky that you're not you know one of them yet you know because that you you're basically been let off you know because everyone else has been cursed we're kind of the maybe the lucky ones who haven't been you know like because we're still alive but then who is the living dead really the zombies or the people 
<laughs> they're in a situation that's it's impossible to look at rationally. I suppose that's what you have. Is like yeah. they're all trying to, in their own way, look at it rationally. Whether even if that's a version of going mad, because many of yeah. the characters in Day of the Dead seem to be going to put it mildly stir crazy. Whether that's in yeah. a traditionally sort of you know aggressive military macho way, yeah. or you know an isolationist, you know just turning to alcoholism, <laughs> yeah. kind of, and you know and, and sort of like some of the soldier characters have you know essentially sort of childish. Um, uh, infantile kind of uh, senses of humour that get, seem to get them through or at least get them through the day. Yeah, and the one soldier who doesn't like Miguel is like having a nervous breakdown. Yes. The other one who's got any sense about him whatsoever. Uh, yeah, and I love that. I love those scenes when, like, you know, they they have the finish their meetings and they literally walk off in different directions. You know, it's just great. Like, you know, Billy and John go that way, and you know, and then the scientists go that way, and the military go down another corridor, and it's just so brilliant. It's just showing that you know. They're, they're not pulling in the same direction whatsoever so you know this isn't going to end well i suppose uh, to echo your t- mention of the sitcoms um when it comes to sort of you know uh, zombie survival stories often involve a, a close quarter sharing and arguing over resources tactics strategy etc you know that that tends to happen in most sitcom settings and i suppose um it's also echoed by you know in, in the late noise you had charlie brooker make that um, dead set yeah, you know, which yeah. in many ways now comes across as a bit of a unofficial pilot for Black Mirror. It's very much a proto Black Mirror, really, isn't it? When you look at it, yeah. Yeah, where, where you know the the, the, the zombie fort- the fortress against the zombie outbreak actually is the Big Brother house and actually has people you know stuck together in the proximity through this artificial reason dealing again with this sort of existential dread. Yeah, it's very Day of the Dead in that respect <laughs> when yes. you think about it. But yeah, no, it's uh, I mean since the Romero trilogy, the initial trilogy, so it's the, you know which kind of ended in eighty five. Um, I, what's interesting is that it it starts then to become more of a mainstream genre with Return of the Living Dead, which was actually the same year as um, Day of the Dead in '85, and was released about the same time, which was obviously, as as I said before, very damaging to Day of the Dead's box office results. Um, but that's when it starts really to become a mainstream thing, because Return of the Living Dead, as punk as it looks and as kind of like you know B movie ish, it's very much a, a a studio you know very well financed you know dan o'bannon script you know guy wrote alien mm. funnily enough and um and then from then on i mean what's next we have the remake of night of the living dead in 1990 yeah which, which i, I saw once i think yeah yeah it's pretty it's not not that great i'd forgotten it? tony todd was in it yeah tony todd uh, apparently spoke to um the actor dwayne uh jones who played um uh what's, God, what's his name the other character's name ben was it in the original? Ben, yeah, yeah. and uh, he apparently said he basically gave him his blessing to go ahead and do that, which is which is great. And uh, so, and it's a perfectly well-made film. Tom Savini directed it. He's the makeup, uh, you know, makeup uh, master. Uh, what do you call it? Makeup um, master. Mm-hmm. And um, then we get into the nineties, and uh, we get uh, Peter Jackson's Brain Dead, which was ninety-two. I suppose you get into that interesting thing, don't you? Of uh, endlessly debatable of what you consider to be a zombie movie or not. Um, yeah. Brain Dead. I, I think it's just because it's got that crazy OTT Peter Jackson energy. I almost see it yeah. as somewhere between the Romero movies and uh, and the Evil Dead. You well, know? we missed. Sorry, yes, I missed the Evil Dead, which was uh, two, which was 1987, which I'm still not convinced is a zombie movie per se. I mean, because it does have, it's a possession movie. It's a ghost story, really. That's that was the way I kind of see it. You know, the you know human bodies do get possessed and come back from the dead. So mm-hmm. I suppose it's technically got a zombie element in it. But I always saw it as more of a, a poltergeist, what was zomb- a ghost movie. Myself. Well, the, what's the, what this is showing is that the, uh, the zombie, like Romero's uh, nerd zombie purism, goes back um, further than just uh, running versus walking zombies, doesn't yeah. it? You know, there's <laughs> yeah. always a bit. We've, ever since 1968, people have been taking this very seriously, and these yeah. kind of, you know, they're essentially generic divisions or stylistic divisions between sorts of horror but uh, yeah. they, they do tend to mean a lot to, to fans you know? well, it's amazing with horror in general just how many sub-genres there are it's like heavy metal you know I can't think of another genre of cinema that has sub-genres really I mean what what are the comedy perhaps yeah I suppose so. I, and I suppose part of that's again commercial isn't it it's like the pr- proliferation of relatively cheap horror movies and the attempt to find novelty in that genre yeah. to sell it but it's also you know the Again, there is there are as many anxieties as there are specific humans. You know, yeah. every, everyone has their own nightmarish anxieties and twists on those. Yeah, absolutely, and um, and it's an easy way to, like you said, to market them as well. So you know exactly what it if it does what it says on the tin. Just before we uh, move on from Day of the Dead, um, I just had one last question to ask you, sort of more specifically about that film. Um, obviously, the the, the character of, of but well, the quasi character of Bub in that. Yes. Um, we were talking before about I think we both like about the Romero trilogy that the. The nature of the epidemic of the of the zombie plague, you know, curse is is, is undefined, and mm. 
implied to be uncurable or, yeah. or certainly not cured within the films obviously in the in terms of the original trilogy with with bub you kind of get the closest to probing at the edges of whether cure rehabilitation anything is possible with zombies um what do you think of that do you i mean do you think that because i've wondered myself like i i I enjoy bub and the actor and the makeup and Uh, you know just just the role the the role he plays in day of the bat but do you do you think that's skirting dangerously close to i almost sound like the scientist myself like meddling with things that you shouldn't (laughs) in the film no i I think that what i like about that uh, bob thing is it is it's kind of uh you know first of all bob is you know homicidal (laughs) <laughs> for a start he's not that nice <laughs> yes. you know uh, as soon as he gets a gun he aims at Rhodes and tries to shoot him you know he's intelligent and uh, plus he uh, um, Logan brings him pieces of meat from human beings to eat so mm. he's still got the craving for human flesh he's just slightly more intel- intelligent therefore slightly more docile and the way I see it it's just a reflection of the human counterparts he's just saying not everyone's a dickhead <laughs> you know in yes, the zombie yeah. world most of them are mm. 99% of the world are dickheads but there's that 1% there okay I suppose, in a sense, um, yeah, as you say, you know, the um, parts of his human personality start to emerge, but it, yeah. it's not really going much beyond stuff that you, you've kind of hinted at already in Dawn. You know, the sort of memory, uh, yeah. the memory of life. Uh, yeah, yeah, and using tools, and they, they directly say that in Dawn, don't they? Like, you know, that you know, because he says, you know, some of these creatures have been seen using tools, and he says, well, I'd like to remind you that even, you know, prime, well, even apes may adopt those things in times of need or whatever so it's like that thing that you know there's the, what's really eerie actually in day which i've uh, as i get better quality versions of these movies on different um solid formats you know like so i started off on recorded off tv and then i got a dvd now i've got blu-ray that uh, when logan gives him the telephone and says hello to your aunt say hello to your aunt alicia he says it he says hello aunt alicia you can hear him say it and then you know and then um uh, Rhodes threatens him immediately and don't, no, they don't talk about that mm. but that's a huge thing you know like Bob just spoke you know and it's kind of like you know it's that's quite a, a big deal that they just watch is really eerie they just brush over that and Rhodes just wants to shoot him you know it's just I was, uh, I was just as you said that I was fondly remembering the glee in the scientist <laughs> actor's performance uh, oh, Richard, Richard Liberty he's just an amazing performance and I mean, everyone in that movie is just fantastic. I just love it. I know it's all kind of ramped up to 11, but all the performances, but they're just so brilliant. And they're all, you know, we were talking before about how um, uh, Romero told this story about putting on Day of the Dead for his kids, you know, and he was driving them somewhere. So his Romero's kids are watching Day of the Dead. In the what a childhood. Car. Yeah, <laughs> amazing. And um, Romero was listening to the audio, uh, obviously not look, seeing the, the, the movie playback, and you know presumably not having heard it for a long time realized that it could work as a radio play because so much of day of the dead is human interaction and long conversations i mean there's there's a Mm. 20 minute scene in the mess hall where they just talk and argue and discuss and it's so so brilliantly written and so you know it's just a fantastic script and the performances are very um uh, sort of hype i don't know what the right word is so they are quite theatrical aren't they yeah very very yeah so you you're always aware of who's who and what's going on who the bad guys are you know and and um i mean joe Pilato in that who plays captain rhodes that performance is just amazing i just love it it's just so over the top and he's just so evil and uh i think he could have done some great stuff in mainstream hollywood i'm it's a shame that he didn't really get his uh moment in the sun mm. do you remember the name of the actress who uh, is the sort of um, nominal lead in day of the day uh, it's laurie cardiel i think you pronounce it mm. um yeah she's um i've actually got her on facebook uh, funnily <laughs> enough and uh, she i sent her a yeah a fan uh, inbox message and uh, you know just sort of like you know a, a brief but you know a very heartfelt message and she didn't respond uh, which, which is <laughs> probably absolutely for the best probably fair enough but yeah i've still got her on facebook so she you know i see all of her very you know day-to-day mundane posts and everything <laughs> like that and then um, I, I believe you've met the actor who played captain rhodes uh, yeah we we met her we went to a fantastic uh, double bill in glasgow at the um uh, glasgow um i think it was i can't remember it was a we might just call the Glasgow Film Theatre. It's a very good cinema, anyway, in Glasgow. And it was uh, Dawn and Day of the Dead back to back. And uh, Ken Faree, who uh, is in Dawn of the Dead and uh, plays, who plays Peter, and also plays Keenan's dad from Keenan and Kel, uh, more importantly, yes, immortally, um, was there. And also Joe Pilato, who plays Captain Rhodes, and they both did a Q and A and signed autographs, and they were just brilliant, like really funny, really amazing speakers. So that, that was a great screening. And there was a lot of people who hadn't seen Day of the Dead before, which was, I was so jealous. I remember saying to like the people either side of me, like, this is going to be, 
I'm so jealous of you that you haven't seen this and you're watching it for the first time in the cinema and Captain Rhodes is sitting like four <laughs> rows in front of you. Uh, but yes, that was that was a great, great experience. Wonderful. Uh, well, I'm just about to move on, but um, I just had one final question for you and it's it's basically to fill in the gaps of my own ignorance efficiently. Obviously, George A. Romero has gone on to make uh, other, you know, other movies. Obviously, there's, there's some great ones to check out, aren't there? You know, uh, yeah. Martin, uh, The Crazies. Yeah. Um, yeah. See, he made a movie called Season of the Witch as well around that time. He made a lot of movies between uh, Night and Dawn, actually. Yeah, mm. There's a lot of movies like Martin is probably the most celebrated. Um, I was going to ask you, because he's made other movies that have tended to be lumped in as, you know, uh, quote unquote dead movies. Yes. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of in, in some respect, or at least in his own regard, you know, part of this series yeah. beyond the original trilogy. Trilogy. I think I'm right. No, I've seen Land of the Dead. Yep. That's the mid noughties one with uh, Dennis Hopper in it. Yep. I've seen that once, and I, I remember it fairly. You know, I, I remember it quite liking it. Don't really remember any anything more than that. Uh, and I haven't seen any of the others. Oh, okay. Which would you say is the strongest post trilogy <sighs> Romero dead movie? The in second trilogy, if you like. Um, that's really it's a, such a difficult question because. Land of the Dead is a studio film. It's the most like uh, mainstream that he ever got, and he mm. said it was a terrible, terrible experience because Universal, who made it, kind of interfered. And then you hear, you know, all these stories when you're used to working independently off your own budgets, you can do whatever the hell you want. Having said that, the movie is really solid. Um, it has some really interesting stuff about the Bush administration, Dennis Hopper being this kind of. Um, you know tyrant at the top of a tower you know in high culture so it's kind of like you know you've got this you know and he's got a committee at the top who decides basically who lives in the tower and who doesn't you know who lives and who dies essentially mm -hmm. so there's loads of interesting stuff going on i mean there's some really hammy performances hammy dialogue um you know the zombie stuff is a little bit tired i mean there's some great makeups in it and stuff you know but it's it's not it's not brilliant mm. I think, interestingly enough, I really uh, Diary of the Dead was had, had quite a lot to say about social media and about YouTube, the YouTube generation, and you know, like you know how the ease of filming and you know how you get your information more from uh, social media than you do from mm -hmm. real media. Had a lot to say, didn't say it very well. Survival of the Dead is is really fun. Actually, it's it's uh, that uh, goes back to the uh, normal uh, film. It's not handheld. It's uh, it's kind of a normal film mm -hmm. um, format, if you like, and it's set on an island, and there's like two feuding families, and it feels more like a neo western zombie western type of thing. Right, right. Yeah. I think that was Romero trying to have fun and making a western zombie movie. Um, it's quite fun. So it's worth worth checking out. Worth check. Yeah, I think so. D skip Diary of the Dead. I don't think Diary of the Dead is a great film by any means. I think that Land and Survival are worth watching. That's great. Fantastic. Well, um, uh, we're just going to play a. Uh, audio clip uh, from one of my favorite scenes in day of the dead uh, and then we can take a short break and we'll be back to talk a little bit about world war z sweet you were sent down here to do a job my job is to fly the whirly bird i've been doing that job just fine you have the protection of this facility you eat our food you drink our water and you don't lift a finger to help neither one of you <laughs> we don't believe in what you're doing here, Sarah. <laughs> hey, you know what all they keep down here in this cave? Man, they got the books and the records of the top 500 companies. They got a defense department budget down here. And they got the negative for all your favorite movies. They got microfilm with tax return and newspaper stories. They got immigration records and census reports. And they got official accounts of all the wars and plane crashes and volcano eruptions and earthquakes and fires and floods and all the other disasters that interrupted the flow of things in the good old U.S. of A. Now, what does it matter, Sarah, darling? All this filing and record keeping. We ever gonna give a shit? We even gonna get a chance to see it all? This is a great big 14 mile tombstone! With an epitaph on it that nobody gonna bother to read. Now here you come, here you come, with a whole new set of charts and graphs and records. What you gonna do? Bury them down here with all the other relics of what? Once was. I'm a 
tell you about this. Yeah, I'm going to tell you about this. You ain't never going to figure it out. Just like they never figured out why the stars are where they're at. It ain't mankind's job to figure that stuff out. So what you're doing is a waste of time, Sarah. And time is all we got left, you know. I'm doing that's all there's left to do. Shame on you. There's plenty to do. Plenty to do. So as long as there's you and me and maybe some other people, we could start over. Start fresh. Get some babies. And teach them, Sarah. Teach them never to come over here and dig these records out. You want to put some kind of explanation down here before you leave? Here's one as good as any like you defend. We've been punished by the Creator. He visited a curse on us. So we might get a look at who. hell was like. Maybe he didn't want to see us blow ourselves up and put a big hole in his sky. Maybe he just wanted to show us he was still a boss man. Maybe he figured we was getting too big for our bitches, trying to figure his shit out. Welcome back, and uh, now we're going to talk about uh, another zombie fiction work. Um, uh, Matt, would you like to tell uh, listeners what it is? I'm still getting over that clip, to be honest. <laughs> <It's> just how <laughs> great too. is that speech? It's incredible. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, yeah, so um, next we're going to talk about World War Z, or World War Z. Yeah, should we agree? World War Z? I always say Z. Let's say Z. I don't Let's know if that's Z. correct English or Let's not. Let's say but... Z. Uh, so yeah, World War Z, um, this was uh, the follow-up to uh, Max Brooks's Zombie Survival Guide, which was released in 2003. Max Brooks is the son of Mel Brooks, the comedy director, and uh, he, uh, I, I don't know, I mean, has he, is he, has he authored anything else before the, he has, the I Zombie had a quick Survival look. Guide? Yeah, before, well, I'm not sure about before the Zombie Survival Guide, but he's certainly done quite a lot of writing in the sort of, uh, well, over a decade since um, World War Z came out. Uh, yeah. He's done, he's done television writing he's done uh, he's done some other books um quite a lot of uh, sort of um, sci-fi fantasy genre stuff yeah yeah and it's a it's so but you introduced me to this um i think uh, I'd, I'd i'd always seen the zombie survival guide lying around at people's houses i knew it was a popular book and then he and then i recognized the author's name when i saw that he'd followed it up with world war z and this is a much more comprehensive uh and it's an actual uh, it's 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 a book of accounts of the zombie holocaust that happened throughout the world and it's written in a way. Um, well, maybe you could better explain it and how it, how how it's structured. Yeah. Well. I'll, yeah. I'll get in. I'll I'll get into that. I suppose. So my um, you were talking before about your relationship with the Resident Evil mm. series and um, and kind of how it fed in and sort of almost like lit the fire for the you know the the, the true zombie fandom and the, the yeah. Romero appreciation etc. Yeah. I think although I'd gone you know through through the movies and I I'd kind of watched a lot of zombie movies including by the time this came out I'd watched Shaun of the Dead you know we were well into the sort of zombie renaissance if you, so to yeah. speak. I think when I because I I picked up a copy of World War Z um, when I was a student um, and this would probably be in sort of two thousand seven eight I think um, yeah so it was it was a fairly new book then it was published in two thousand six I think I believe right? yeah. I think so yeah. sounds about right I think so and I picked up a paperback copy of it and I think it, it's it's almost like although it's coming out the other side it's almost like my version of Resident Evil in the sense that it's a piece of zombie fiction that maybe spoke very specifically to my interests and kind of you know a lot of stuff that I had you know was curious about or didn't realize i was curious about about the idea of a, a global zombie epidemic it's a very versatile genre isn't it like you know it can appeal to so many people in different um what's the word different formats different um genres and it can appeal to so many people in so many different ways i think that's true and i think it sort of goes back to what i was saying about the you know individual anxieties you know and uh 
uh, individual terrors you know are matched by those those in, individual fascinations and you know i yeah. you know anyone can watch a zombie movie or uh, think about the sort of topic of zombie fiction and kind of come up with their own questions they want answered their own topics that they want to address yes i think world war z scratched that itch for me in quite a big way and you were sort of mentioning the format before it, it is i suppose i'm not sure how much max brooks is aware of these sort of precedents but it's 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 structured as an oral history as they say uh, and it's uh, what it reminded me of was seeing episodes of the world at war yeah, yeah. As, a, as a kid um which is an amazing um documentary for those of you who haven't seen it about the second world war which relies quite heavily not only on you know archive photography and and footage yeah. uh, where it exists but also a, a lot on talking heads so i, I guess when when we'll, um, the world at war was made um a lot of the people uh, who lived through the second world war and played vital roles in it were already old people yeah uh, in the 60s 70s um and and were interviewed for posterity uh in, in a very in a fascinating way world war z, z world war z i'm gonna keep doing that world <laughs> war z uh presents itself as that from a global uh a globally impactful zombie epidemic that's meant to be set uh, i'm not sure if they ever quite specify but you know 10 15 years maybe after uh, the the relative clear up of such an epidemic and it's it's not written uh, chronologically as in you know the the interviews as they go through the chapters aren't uh, chronological accounts so some of them it jumps around a lot doesn't it in time it does specific yeah it it's it's broadly chronological in the mm -hmm. sense that the early chapters deal with the uh, early stages of the epidemic which originates in china uh, wow. something that's been on my mind quite a lot recently <laughs> yeah uh, the resonance of that's pretty unfortunate but you know they they go into that in the in the book some of the implications of that um and it then it deals with the uh, early stages it's, it's it's a book by an american author uh, it's it's obviously it's quite global but it's skewed through an american perspective and a lot of the chapters deal with a you know at least a north american perspective on events what's really got to me about it just in in you know general sense was just the um, the, the the what disturbed me about it was just the the detail of you know, it just it, it, Max Book, Max Brooks, the way he writes it, he describes not only sort of what battles would look like and what sort of um, form like war would take against the living dead, but also how you know human weapons, uh, how how they affect the zombies themselves, and these you know things, how bullets affects a, a creature that can't feel pain, yes, and and yes. things like that, and also how the seasons, you know, how the elements take control of them you know for example uh zombies can't aren't as dangerous in nor northern canada because they're mm. frozen and they can't move you know and things like that you know it's, so you, it's, it's full just... of uh, it's full of fascinating details isn't it you yeah know, very, you know morbid by the very nature but there's a lot of stuff in there that uh you know i i think so, so this is i kind of want to get this out of the way um world war z is is the sort of book that i might not like you know because we were just talking before about how things when things are over explained uh, or over gone into or you know maybe, maybe when there's a sort of surfeit of you know fanfic type mm. ideas and something it's not necessarily something i'm going to dig you know i do like yeah. that ambiguity um i think world wars as ed does keep the um does keep the um romero uh vagueness about what's going on you know I don't, there's no although it's being spread in a sort of tra transmittable uh you know bites uh, mm. skin contact kind of way there's 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 no sense that they've overdone it it's not a rage virus it is it is just zombiness you know the the, the, the you said it, it originates in uh, china in the book i mean do they ever say what is it just you know one person it started from it is that you know like is it a, you know is there any kind of explanation there of how it got started in the, the the early chapters deal with the doctor's account in china uh, mm -hmm. and he talks about it as a thing which is already kind of on it's a little bit like, like the living dead it's already yeah. kind of underway uh, and uh, there are hints of sort of like rural chinese areas that it might have emerged from but i don't think you ever get any sort of explanation of you know it's not like there's there's nothing there's no uh, venusian satellite equivalent from like right. the living dead there's no there's no like tomb that's been unearthed or sort of che yeah. cheesy b movie idea yeah. like that it's nothing just supernatural per se no 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 <laughs> apart not... from the phenomenon itself but there's nothing uh... yeah it, it's just you know the zomb zombiness is upon us and i think there's yeah. also kind of there's a bit of a creative vagueness in the, in the film as well you know a lot of people have commented on the, the sort of Shaun of the dead and onwards thing of these movies all essentially take place in a world where people know zombie movie tropes but they don't really have the word for zombie or yeah, yeah. you know you get that in walking dead as well i think this sort of plays in the same waters where people are aware they're in a strange movie -esque survival situation but they yeah. don't seem to really quite have the dialogue for it yeah yeah because yeah, it would almost be too on the nose to sort of admit that zombie, the zombie genre was a thing because anyone would just be going oh my god it's like night of the living dead you know and that that takes the edge off it somehow mm. doesn't it that softens it mm. um obviously Shaun of the dead's a, par a complete parody so they they did mention that but like 
yeah, I, I've always thought like in The Walking Dead and well, certainly obviously in the Rivera universe, there's no mention of this, you know, being anything that anyone's ever encountered before in pop culture or in real life. I think I think a good way to look at World War Z as a book is um, the, the, it's it's kind of Max Brooks um, using, uh, we talked before about the Romero trilogy being sort of, it's almost like a loose anthology. And yeah. obviously as you know, as he went on to make more dead movies, it, it sort of expands an anthology, but they were set in the same universe. This is almost that with a sort of illusion of narrative structure in the sense that you are following one uh event you know a global zombie epidemic and, and it's um its developments but you are he's playing around with a bunch of different voices a bunch of different narrators a bunch of different characters uh global settings uh political settings different junctures of the war and there's quite a lot of quite lightly worn genre um tribute in there as well like there's um there's a whole section in the middle of the book that deals with a um i think it's a teenage uh, japanese guy who's um surviving in you know in the ruins of a japanese city and um that starts to then play as he moves into the rural japanese countryside with some of the sort of um, blind shogun kind of uh, mm. movie tropes yeah uh, and samurai movie tropes and stuff like that and equally you've got um elements i think set in the chinese navy that deal with you know a, a chinese submarine commander which uh, sort of gets quite heavily into the sort of hunt for red october s kind of naval warfare how, how does the, the um not having read the whole book i've read bits of it and i've certainly seen the movie mm. which we'll talk about um how does the naval thing come into it in terms of like you said about submarines i mean how does that is that is that just into into fighting with human beings or is that more like well, actually I, to do with the zombie threat I, I suppose much as in many chapters especially in the midsection of the book there's a lot of the brooks is sort of saying you know well what what would be happening here what would be happening here what would logically be happening here and there's, there's a chapter that deals with what semi-autonomous submarines out at sea you know away for months um how would they be dealing with not only the political turmoil back on the surface oh, yeah. but also the uh, kind of responsibilities that they have to do with like their nuclear armaments yeah, uh, yeah so i think that chapter in particular deals with the um a chinese civil war uh what side the captain takes in that chinese civil war and obviously what role that plays in the greater sort of zombie epidemic and its containment so it's he really leaves no stone unturned does he that's what's so great about it he goes from very very small details about individual cases and individual zombies to like huge battles then human politics and that's what's so amazing about it and why it deserves such accolades because it's it's just covers everything i think one of the reasons i was really um keen to talk about this today is you know as we are recording we are in the early stages of the pandemic and a lot of the particularly early chapters of world war z deal with deal with an epidemic pandemic situation and various human reactions to it as you say political responses i'm a bit of a politics geek so I really enjoy that aspect of the book where they talk about how governments, uh, businesses, um, individuals would respond and not only just how they would respond, but what incentives are driving them, uh, what yeah. perverse and you know natural understandable incentives are driving them and why, you know, obviously it being a dramatic book, you know, people respond largely too late uh, yeah. until things have <laughs> yeah. got very badly, but you know, there are kind of logical A to B to C reasons why that happens. Um, and I think particularly some of the grimmer aspects of the book deal not with the failure to contain the zombie outbreak but with the success of containing the zombie outbreak yeah. and what decisions need to be made for that to happen yeah. um, there's some focus in the book on uh, South Africa uh, there's some focus in the book on uh, Israel there's focus on uh, the way some European nations handle the zombie ep epidemic how some Pacific nations deal with the epidemic um, and everything it's, it's from how of... personal politics and religion uh, affect people's decision making yeah i mean it's quite good at taking the the sort of status quo of the world and all the things that are unjust or unbalanced or on edge about the current geopolitics and saying if you dropped an epidemic in the middle of a zombie epidemic in the middle of this what would what's the how would this natural starting point lead to pretty gross outcomes and, yeah. and it does that i mean there's also things in there you know we talked before about political art there's I don't know much about Max Brooks politics, but you know the, the, the certain things you can infer from chapters of the book where he's either criticizing, um, uh, praising, or maybe just fetishizing certain nations and their approaches and the sort of images of the, there's a, there's a chapter about North Korea, for example, yeah. which is probably one of the most memorable chapters in the book, which deals more from an outsider's perspective. Uh, and I think that's probably telling itself about the kind of horror that probably a lot of global observers feel when they think about North Korea and its politics and its situation in general, um, but it takes a zombie epidemic. And one of the reasons why it's one of those memorable chapters is it, is it implies a lot about the North Korean situation yeah. uh, without, without really the... showing you or even yeah. telling you much about it, relying heavily on rumours and suggestion. And it's just horrible. It's just like the worst 
possible you know situation to be in like. the, the situation in north korea is 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 sort of implied to be contained but with all the horror that that word holds right contained yeah, yeah. very much perhaps against the will of the remaining populace jesus yeah the, the the lengths they have gone to to like contain it i just have no humanity involved whatsoever and one of the more <laughs> controversial aspects of the book i haven't really heard any you know, sort of writers of color talking about this but i imagine there's, there's a few takes on it it would be um and I'll, if i find any i'll put them in the in the show notes but um one of the things about the zombie epidemic in world war z is that it is the, the epidemic is sort of eventually contained by various measures around the world that different governments different situations but it's essentially based on apartheid measures or you know yeah. explicitly um a, a sol- you know the solution for it comes out of kind of apartheid era south africa governmental plans for containing elements of the populace you know yeah. so, like you know explicitly racist policies essentially mm-hmm. adapted to fit a zombie epidemic and i think I, perhaps I wouldn't say it's a weakness of the book exactly, but you know, there's, there's not like lengthy soul-searching examination of that. Although individual characters are shown to be stricken and traumatized by some of the implications, um, but you know, it, it just goes back to that political art thing. There's there's loads of implications in World War Z, and the fact that it examines even a fraction of them is pretty impressive. Uh, the the bits I remember um, that were just so wonderful were you know I get down to the nitty gritty of the zombie descriptions and detail because obviously mm. I'm into that visceral side of it was um more, more broadly the, the the america having to readjust its uh military techniques mm. i thought was really clever because it's like is it the battle of yonkers when they go in Vietnam, yeah, all yeah. guns blazing that's like the kind of low point of the war for them where they uh the, the phrase that uh, we're almost fighting the last war yeah they essentially yeah. try and take high grade i guess mid noughties iraq war era military grade technology and freeze them against the zombies humvees and machine guns and you know and the rest of it to very little effect yeah yeah yeah. so so then they 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 correct me if i'm wrong on this because this is just my memory of it when i when i read it many years ago but was the um they come up with more of a sort of a civil uh, american civil war technique of uh, using more musket like weapons that's right yeah they they find out that the uh, machine guns are not having much effect and they're just wasting ammo basically against the zombies it's ineffective so they come up with a technique of more is it stand and shoot drop and reload that's uh, right accurate uh, military techniques and then standing in a line to do so yeah there's a lot of stuff like that there's a lot of stuff about technique there's a lot of stuff about strategy there's a lot of stuff about equipment actually yeah you know those being equipped with sort of uh, things that are barely above cudgels or pike level sort of um, uh, great things but also very easily reloadable rifles uh, a bunch of stuff about that there's a lot of the mid chapters of the book deal with in fact i was thinking about this recently because you know obviously quite a mainstream term in sort of left-wing politics and that is the green new deal and you know mm. that's meant to sort of deliberately evoke um, amongst other things you know the fdr's sort of new deal for america in the 30s and i think you start to see some of max brooks's kind of you know maybe 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 sort of fairly center liberal kind of thoughts about how american society maybe needs rejigging yeah reflected in world war z because you 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 have a, in some of the middle chapters you talk about how like the world economy but also the american economy is being rejigged around very necessary survival skills now and yeah. some of that involves more cooperative working and less individualism yeah you know in a wartime setting but i guess that's what kind of fdr's plan reminds people of and it's interesting to unpick some of that and uh, back to the nitty-gritty like i loved the uh, some of the description of like after the javelin missiles had gone off uh, zombies would continue to walk through the blast but with their intestines on the outside and their, their lungs that's right had, yeah uh, because of the pressure of the explosions they continue to walk towards you but their lungs are hanging on the outside of their body and there's some of the description of like how again how weapons affect creatures that can't feel pain mm. or have no nerve endings to speak of and the and the, the the other thing i think i mentioned briefly before was i remember a description of um people walking through canadian tundra and seeing zombies frozen solid in a walking position and with their eyes darting and stuff you know so it's kind of and, and you know it's like you're going to be safe in the winter because the zombies are frozen mm. outdoors and you're going to worry when you go further south and they start to defrost mm. and things like that and it's just these practical things that you know have never ever been addressed in any zombie mm. movie because they're so environmental and i think yeah. i think that's one reason why you know it's 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 a well, i suppose it's a novel you know but it's it's kind of uh it can it can cover so much more of that without budgetary restriction you know yeah and, and yeah. Uh, i think you know we we're talking before about anxieties that drive horror you know i mean that max brooks covers so much ground in that book and he's you know to be fair he's drawing from a, a lot of different as i say generic templates and but he's he's there are so many anxieties wrapped into that book you know you, you could see it as a mid-90s you know certainly yon- the yonkers chapters you know an iraq war reaction uh yeah iraq uh, you know a reaction to sort of military um um 
insecurity in general yeah. from American perspective but there's just so many things in there about you know uh, it's, it's strong in everything from you know like uh, the walking dead to the road in terms yeah. of thinking about you know uh, the insecurities of families the insecurities of communities uh, things to do with um, you know military and victim rehabilitation you know yeah. that's covered um, there's quite a lot covered in the book and I, you know if, if someone if, if if all you know and we'll get onto this in a second if all you know is the movie I would suggest you check out the book um, it's it's a very enjoyable read and uh, and I think has quite a lot to say I think that, you know that what's great about zombies and you know, and one of the reasons the book is so successful is um, it works on so many levels is because, like, monsters are basically metaphors and zombies are the zeitgeist monster of this and probably the last century as well. You know, they just, they, they can work, you can put them in different contexts and, and you, there's so much you can read into it and I think that's what they're, they're very malleable and uh, they just speak to all of our fears about everything and that's that's why the book is, like, you know, it, it, it would... <laughs> You know, it's it's almost um, bad taste to talk about in this pandemic that's going on at the moment. But you know, if it, that's that's what zombie movies are about. They're kind of a they're kind of a universal solvent, aren't they? Of like yeah. um, genre fiction and horror at the moment, zombies. They're kind of uh, they're, they're something that you can just use to apply to anything. I think. In, I mean, I suppose you could say that about a lot of you know very primal kind of monsters. But I think there's yeah. something about zombies being this wave of uh, change. Yeah. You know, they they are, um, and that's you know we talked I think off mic about the. The very fine line in zombie and survival fiction in general about uh the fine line between a horror uh, a horrific outcome and a fantasy yeah and zombies are i think because they are that wave of change for the status quo they contain both those things within them yeah i think that you know that that's the you, you see the memes uh, you know about this things like you know the, the you know the difficult most difficult thing about the zombie holocaust is going to be pretending that i'm not enjoying it you know and things like that <laughs> you know it's like and and i think you've you've really hit the nail on the head then where you say zombies represent change and change isn't always a bad thing. Yeah, change is, change is neutral or, change is or chaotic neutral. neutral, as you might say. Yeah, change is, uh, you know, is that, yeah, that's absolutely right. I wanted to uh, mention quickly because um, one aspect of uh, World War Z that, you know, the book uh, that I've not really experienced that you have is uh, I, you've, you've um, listened to some of it, haven't you? Because it was yes. adapted into, uh, I think, an award winning uh, audio book. Um, using several actors, um, and I, I believe it's a, it's very successful. I've not, I've hardly listened to any of it. There are some big actors in it, and it's and it's read by Max Brooks, and, and he plays the interview, which is great. So you get Max Brooks, you know, doing the end, and he's just a great, you know, he's got a great voice, and he's really good, you know, it's, it's his book, and he's really good at getting uh, getting the point across, and um, and and it's and it's it's perfect. I mean, I think the audio book adaptation. Oh, well, I mean, sorry, I think the audio book adaptation is is you know is much better than the film adaptation because it's essentially what the book is mm. it's an interview interviewing someone and that person is played by an actor from that with the, that accent mm. from wherever that person's from so it's exactly how it should be you know it's a i mean i remember mark hamill's one of the actors isn't he uh, uh yeah yes yeah. Mark, that's right yeah he, he describes the battle of yonkers actually so he's one of the american soldiers i think um the, the movie world war z it, they would never do this but world war z could have been that mm. and it would have been terribly disturbing and wholly original if max brooks had made it for you know half a million dollars or something you know and mm. or gone to blumhouse and made it for you know seven million or five million what is it they do and and done a sit down interview movie where they just talk to people mm. across the table maybe in different settings maybe in the same setting well imagine some of the wonderful older actors you could have brought into it as well you know like you know you i mean you know i'm name at random clint eastwood but you know like people like that you know people yeah. like richard farnsworth you know people you could bring in to oh. just be these characterful older actors who maybe have this past that you see in stills you know yeah. uh, what I, I mean i know this would never happen but, but i don't know I, I say that but you know in this in this area you could imagine it as an hbo series adaptation of um world war z where you are um it's basically the world at war i mentioned it yeah. before you know you're essentially watching mostly elderly actors <laughs> yeah. narrate stuff over horrific looking still shots and yeah. some footage you know <laughs> that would be that, i mean the, yeah there's so many great ways you could have done it and could still do it i mean it could still be done uh in that respect in that way and i think it would be it would just be infinitely better than what happened mm. uh should we talk about the movie yeah let's talk about it a little bit i um so so the the movie adaptation came out and i think it was in about 2013 yeah yeah, yeah that's um, right and it was um ushered into being by i think i think was it largely or it eventually ended up being by brad pitt's production company yeah uh, yeah he certainly had a hand in it um, and he stars in it he plays the lead character whoever i can't remember the character's name mm. Do, uh, can i can i ask your overall opinion of that film uh gobshite gobshite yeah <laughs> it's, it's not good <laughs> 
it's it, it's incredibly it's called world war z it's world war z in name only mm, really yeah. uh, it's it's you always uh, kind of sound like an arsehole fan if you say things like that don't you but i i really i i am that arsehole fan yeah i cop to that that's it it really it it takes it takes almost nothing from it, it the glo- the global zombie outbreak as an event is is, yeah. is in it yeah but that but it takes almost no distinctiveness from the style or focus of the book no yeah i don't understand why anyone thought it was good to do it that way i heard a really here's here's i'll tell us quick story that kind of sums up i think the world war z thing is a really interesting story i heard recently uh, in 2009 um the dimension i think it was dimension films had the rights for four years uh, they sort of optioned a remake of an american werewolf in london this director, who's a very famous horror director now, and I, his name escapes me, but he was t- he was telling this story, and he basically said uh, he'd made a horror comedy, he'd make a black comedy movie uh, that had horror elements in it, and he gets called to Dimension Films and um, offered to do a remake of An American Wealth in London, which they had this window of opportunity to greenlight. Mm-hmm. And uh, they said, well, we've called you in here because we loved your previous movie. It was a comedy horror. It was fantastic. And he said, great, yeah, okay, interesting. So what are we going to do with this remake? And they said, well, it's got to be female backpackers, sexy female backpackers. He was like, okay. Okay. Um, we don't want any, like, werewolves in it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We're getting away from the werewolf thing. And he was like, it's called an American werewolf in London. It's like, no, no, it's going to be like a rage virus. Oh. And he was like, okay. And he said, oh, and it can't be funny. Mm. And he's like, you called me in here because I made a funny horror movie. <laughs> and he's like, why did you, <laughs> why did you call, why do you want me? Yeah. And, 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 um, and so that's, you know, pretty much how you could sum up World War Z and its production. It's, it's called World War Z, which is based on the book, World mm. War Z. And mm. it has, it has zombies in it. I'll give it that. I was reading this earlier today. Apparently, Max Brooks, um, you know, they, they optioned the book. It was a successful mm. book, but they they were keen to make a movie of it, and uh, they offered Max Brooks a sole or shared mm. screenwriting credit on it, and he decided not to because he thought his he was not an experienced enough screenwriter to produce uh, a Hollywood movie. And he must have looked at the finished product and just thought, I really should have <laughs> should had a pass that. at that. I think there's one scene about forty minutes into the movie where Brad Pitt talks to someone across a table for about twenty seconds, mm. and that's probably. And someone describes a zombie situation. Mm. That's probably the closest it gets to the book. Well, the problem is that the distinctiveness of the book is is what makes it. You know, I understand. I'm not being naive here. I understand the things about the book that mean it would be difficult to make a conventional movie out of it. Yeah, probably don't then. Mm. But 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 the things about the, the the book are that the weight of the passage of the years and the weight of the war and that distance from it have affected people. Yeah, and that's what you're conveying in it. You know, so if you make if you make a film set in the World War Z universe but during the outbreak with no hindsight, you're you're negating the point of it. You're negating anything that made it distinctive or yeah. a distinctive look at the zombie genre. I'm not saying it has to be a boring World at War aping talking heads film. <laughs> yeah. But to be anything, it has to be a post outbreak film. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it really is just uh it's such a grim marketing tool. I mean it could have just been what would have been a better title for this film? I don't know. I mean it's 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 kind of about a, a a global zombie outbreak, but it doesn't f- ever really feel like that. Even though there's the scene set in I think Philadelphia, the scene set in Wales. Mm. Oh God, lest we say this about the the climax. The the film was actually quite famous at the time for um, having production problems, even mm. as it was in production. It wasn't just even reshoots. It was kind of like during its initial yeah. production. And what you get is this kind of... It starts in, like, Philadelphia with Brad Pitt's character and his family. Then he gets whisked away to a, a, a ship. And then they go to Israel? Mm, I think... I believe, yeah, certainly. And there's a big set piece there. And then he gets on a plane and crash lands in Wales. And you get this kind of strange, like, you know, tacked-on scene at the end that's really dark and looks completely different from the rest of the movie in terms of the way it was shot of uh, Peter Capaldi in a science lab and it looks a bit like the original Resident Evil movie which mm. was god awful as well. It does. So my heart <laughs> and it's funny because I love Peter Capaldi and, and and was was happy that he was in it but my heart sank even further when we got to that bit of the film because you could just kind of you could you could tell the cul-de-sac that the film was driving yeah. into. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> a little dead end. Yeah. And it's like what I want to know was what was the original ending and how was it any worse than that? Like what how could it possibly be worse? I, I like, should have fact checked this but I, I th- I'm sure they were meant to go to Russia.
pressure. It was some, oh. it was something, and I think there might even be a vestigial thing in the film where they they are heading, they're originally heading to Russia and they have to get um, and they crash in Wales. Yeah, it's yeah. it's a really it's an odd turn. I think I think World War Z is is kind of zombie film. We talked about Day of the Dead, and Day of the Dead is phenomenally distinctive, and yeah. you know has has the imprint of a real auteur on it, and you know it's 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 you know for much that I I, I categorize it as the highest B movie possible to make it is yeah. is a real it's a real movie. It's it's you know there's a lot going on. I think World War Z is the worst kind of filmmaking by committee. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's the other end, and it's shockingly expensive. Yeah, exactly. It's so expensive. Did they? they I think it was like two hundred million dollars plus. Uh, and then imagine the marketing budget on top of that, which is I think usually like these days is usually double a film's go. You know, it, it's just crazy. Mm. I heard a really Terry Gilliam uh, said this great quote that um, uh, a camel is a horse designed by committee. Yes, yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, <laughs> and that's yeah. yeah um, World War Z is certainly a camel. Yeah, it's it's a camel if ever I saw one. I yeah. think um, I think one of the things as well about. Um, about the film is it, it it sort of um it almost closed down my interest in world war z like it, yeah. it, it, it's 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 not you know it's not it's not like one of my all-time favorite books or anything like that but it, it's, it tarred it it just tarnished it like you know it was just kind of like how are you going to recommend this book now yeah no it <laughs> had a bit of that yeah no I, I've, I've heard i've heard people speak on the internet about you know thing franchises like that like there's you know there's a there's a, a youtuber i watch who talks about his love for uh, judge dread the character yeah. you know, in the 2000 AD comics and then he, he talks about how throughout a big part of his youth he always had to tell people no n- not the 95 movie oh man uh, dude i have to say like now i have to say have you seen day of the dead they say bloodline no oh, day of the dead with <laughs> mina savari no <laughs> you know 1985 you know uh, yeah it's uh it, it's around. i mean you know obviously again a great stephen king uh quote was um, they said, you know, like I think there was a there was a bad a, a bad Stephen King movie came out, which there are many, um, Sleepwalkers or something. Mm. And someone said, you know, to him, like, you know, how do you feel about these movie like movies tarnishing your books? And he said, no, my books are fine. They're right there. Yeah, <laughs> which you know is a great response. Yeah, yeah, to be fair, absolutely fine. I mean, I was I was going on about the sort of worst aspects of uh, fan criticism and fan nerdery, but I will indulge in one here. Is well, I think it's almost like mature of us that we haven't brought this up yet one thing that the world war z movie does is it features running zombies oh yes oh god right okay i mean that's you know i I, again it's this it's this thing of like have you read the book you know because yeah you feel free to make a running zombie film it's fine to have variants on this some people Mm -hmm. like those that's not what the book features yeah very explicitly (laughs) i love the way the walking dead did the kind of ambling zombies you know they did this thing where they sort of jog they yeah, sort of do a dad yeah. run where they're kind of like power walk power, power walk, walking zombies which i'm fine with uh, they got it right uh yeah i am a slow zombie fan i always will be um i you know i've done this to death this debate yeah no uh, I, I know most of the internet has, i'm but. yeah uh i find them more disturbing i think that's uh there's several reasons i think that's how your body would act if it was reanimated you're not going to move very well for a start um the more decayed you get the less well you're going to move um it's creepier to me the fact that so someone so disheveled can cause you such harm mm. whereas and also it's a slow death it's not a quick death if someone fast can eat through your jugular in two seconds you're going to die very quickly to, i mean to, that's to, not as scary to me i completely agree i mean to, to, this is kind of outside the purview of our conversation now but you know to, to give say 28 days later it's it's credit and you know especially as we're talking about you know pandemic anxieties and things like that yeah you know in in 20 days later for all its unoriginality in other um, fields you know it's david triffid's deaths for example yeah. you know you do get uh a twist on the zombie genre which is more explicitly about a uh, terrestrial virus mm. and you know you get your running zombies and I, there's nothing against that movie but i think what they what they decide in that movie is that the threat of running zombies is somewhat novel at least back when that movie came out and it is a bigger threat it's a more visceral scary threat yes. an urgent threat yeah it's not more horrifying no it's no. not more horrifying it's scary in the moment I yeah that that's that's true and I think it's it's a more imminent threat like you said and it's not as horrifying for me because well I can't see the faces for a start you know that's the thing like they move so quick they're just blurs mm-hmm. and I just don't find it it's like if you wanted to commit suicide in the zombie world in a fast zombie world you just step outside for a minute you're going to be dead in seconds mm. you know if you want to commit suicide <laughs> like he does in Day of the Dead it's going to be slow it's going to take ages you yeah. know for you to do it that's a deterrent yeah you know so it's like it there's so many reasons uh, and i'm kind of sick of arguing so i'll just say i prefer slow zombies they creep me out more 
Um, the, I think that's how your body would move if it was malfunctioning. Mm. Uh, you know, you wouldn't run quicker than you could when you were alive. Well, going back to Day of the Dead briefly, you know, we were talking about Bub and you know his his mm. sort of um, existence and the sort of existential horror of not just the existence of the zombies and the ongoing existence of the zombies, but of the human characters as well. There's the the basic thing if you boil it down is um pe- like running zombies, people with the rage virus, whatever yeah. you want to put on it, they look angry. Yeah, they look furious. Yeah, people zombies in the Romero tradition look lost. Yeah, and that's yes. more resonant. Absolutely, oh, mate. That's it. You've summed it up there. That's beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Makes it so much more moving. I think that's what hit me uh, when I watched the movie last night for the you know, umpteenth time. Was just how bad I felt for the zombies, you know, in the in the movie, and that just brings it to like you know mm. that that just adds, you know, like it's like the Frankenstein thing, and it's like you know you feel empathy for him, you know, you're scared of him, but you also feel uh, you know do you, he mm. didn't he didn't ask for this. You know, it's like exactly, yeah. And I think that you know, it, you, it's interesting to mention Frankenstein because you know, being such a progenitor sort of you know work of the, of the horror, horror genre, you know, th- there's a lot contained in Frankenstein that you can push in different directions. And mm-hmm. there's you know, there's a, there's a lot in the zombie. You know, Frankenstein is is in some ways the original or an original zombie, certainly yeah. in Western literature. And uh, there's a lot of the pathos in there. It's, Apart it's, from Lazarus. Yes, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah, yeah. Shout out to Lazarus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think you know, and, and I think it's to Romero's credit, uh, and you know, to be Max Brooks's credit as well. In mm-hmm. Werewolves, that he he takes that pathos and preserves it, and realizes it's it's a central part of what draws people to this sort of this theme, this mythos, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, that's definitely something that the movie adaptation Werewolves does not do. No, not at all. And it was something that Day of the Dead did really well, actually, with mm-hmm. the the death of logan and bob's uh, mourning of him is really moving mm. and that's the ultimate suspension of disbelief because when you watch that scene you think you know you snap out of it and you go what the hell am i watching you know, why is you know why am i moved by this but it's working it's doing its job and um and yeah and the best monsters are the sympathetic kind i think you know you really feel bad for them and ultimately like you know is in especially especially in the romero trilogy in most um zombie uh stories the humans are the bad guys and they they do bring about their own downfall yeah and that's a really cheery thought to leave us with in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic hooray <laughs> yeah <laughs> look forward to that this might be the last episode which we <laughs> the this first podcast. and the last episode yeah yeah of escape Road. we'll go out on a high um thanks for joining me matt i've really appreciated speaking to you about all that and i think we covered a lot of ground you know it's really nice to talk to you about um sort of you know fairly lifelong fascination uh yeah it's good to get this stuff out actually you know like because it you know occupies my thoughts about 95 percent of the time so it's, uh, it's yeah. good to get it all out on the on the mic definitely healthier um Aye. so i uh, would you like to tell us um, where people can find you on the internet uh yeah uh, it's uh, i have a uh, podcast with my friend mike so we do matt and mike pull focus uh we can be found on youtube uh primarily and wherever you get your podcasts uh we have um as basically a sort of a rambling uh, deep dive into our favorite movies and uh, we have a few specials on there as well so yeah check us out that's fine thank you and uh, i'll encourage our listeners to do that and we'll put your details in the show notes as well uh, and we'll put our contact details in the show notes as well so you'll be able to get in touch with us um and uh thank you for joining us uh, and you'd like to say goodbye matt bye matt and uh see you all soon You've been listening to the Escape Goat podcast, hosted by David Blake Fagiani. If you want to contact the podcast with any feedback or thoughts, you can leave comments on our Libsyn page or under our YouTube videos, or email us at escapegoatpod at gmail.com. You can also reach the show on Twitter on at egoat underscore pod, and follow us for new episode notifications, or get me personally on at dbfagiani. This podcast is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify, as well as our Libsyn site, escapegoatpodcast.libsyn.com. Original intro, outro, and any other incidental music for this podcast is composed, produced, and made available by permission of Richard Gilbert.